Yeah, so for first for, for first couple of times when I actually uh, open the Visual Studio, I'm going to create the project. But after a while, when you're OK with this, then we're going to not create the project anymore and just I'm going to create it before I'm just going to open it. OK, so uh, creating a new project. Oh, by the way, thank you very much for all those people who did the Workshop Zero. Um, I posted something on Teams. Uh, please follow that first poll. Uh, and then uh, modify dot ignore and read me. Some of you did not do the read me and dot ignore properly, so I modified it and I pushed it. So you have to pull to get the corrections. All right, 90% did perfect. Okay, so thank you. And uh, remember that directory is your home. That repository is where you do everything in OOP 244. All the little tests that you have. Be organized. Um, uh, it forces you to be organized because I'm going to look at it and look at the structure. If I see everything's messy, every I'm going to say, "What kind of a sloppy person is this?" So I'm looking at your boss. So try to be organized. Uh, put everything proper in proper places that you are doing. Um, the repositories that we have on uh, on the organization. Well, I mean, like the workshops and uh, things like that. When you get to those things. Uh, instead of just cloning that and working on the repository itself, copy those content into your own repository. Remember, there is one golden rule of uh, Git repositories that a repository cannot have a repository inside. So don't think that you can clone the repository of Seneca College inside your own repository. You can't do that. A repository can't, you cannot have a sub repository. <laughs> sub directories you can, sub repositories you can. So if you want to get a code and modify it and have your changes pushed so we can actually talk about it, it's better to, like when workshop one is posted or something like that, you copy workshop one into your own workshop repository, then start working on it and keep committing and pushing. Yeah, remember, commit, 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 push. Commit, 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 push. You go to washroom, went to washroom. Commit. Every single thing, anything that you do, like uh, stuck, I'm about to think, like, like at the moment that you see it, it's a, it's a moment that you are pausing, that's the time that you commit, okay? Always commit. And tag it, it comes handy when you are coming back to it later on. So I'm going to create a, an empty a C++ uh, uh, project, as usual. I'm going to go to, oh, always place the solution and project in the same repository. Uh, having several uh, uh, projects in a solution is for future. Like when you are developing, let's say, a point of sale system for a company, and sorry, you're uh, creating an e-commerce application for a company, and that e-commerce application includes inventory, uh, point of sale, uh, stores, and so you have different types of application working in parallel. Then you create one solution with five projects in it. Now we are writing a loop that prints five numbers. We don't need to have, to have a solution and projects in it. So uh, for now, place each solution in a project until you get used to it. And again, we are not taking sides to go with Visual Studio. That's not the case. It's not that I prefer one to another. It's just that you need to learn uh, different IDEs. And we happen to use this one. And when you are moving to higher semesters, you're going to um, learn things like code spaces and things like, like, that, like that that is completely on the cloud and uh, Eclipse for Java programming, probably, things like that. So you're going to use different types of IDEs as you are going through it. For the C++ core subjects, it's Visual Studio. So. Um, uh, if you have a Mac, Fusion is your friend. Install Fusion. It's free for the st for students. I um, um, I think I posted the link on uh, on on uh, Microsoft Teams. Download Fusion. Install Windows 10 uh, or 11 if you like to, um, and um, don't clutter it. If you are installing Windows, the only thing you need on it is a Visual Studio. Maybe you want to have Teams so you don't switch back and forth. And those Git MIT stuff that I had. So the Workshop Zero. Essentially, you should do Workshop Zero on it and stop. You don't need anything else because it's just for your uh, schoolwork. And whenever you don't need it, you simply 
shut the visual, uh, the, uh, uh, either suspend or shut down your, your virtual machine, and you have full power of your Mac back. So you don't have to uh, share resources with another one. And 60 gigs for that is more than enough. You don't need to put too many things in there. Uh, all right, so we're going to create the, the project. The project's going to get created in the um, uh, OP244 MBB notes. So we are, which section are we? A? Okay, so the section A. Now I'm going to select the folder and it's going to be 0 2 uh, September 12th. And we start. All right. So the next thing I need to do over here is to connect to the VPN. Oh, I don't need to. I'm in college. I don't need to connect to VPN, do I? I don't think so. I have been working from home for two years. So it's, kind of <laughs> so it's uh, let me see. We'll find out. So if it, if it doesn't come up, it means, we, it means I have to, well, it should hit it. Okay. Monitor went off suddenly and we'll see. Anyways, so let me just check this out. So we are talking about object-oriented programming and uh, that's what we're gonna do. So uh, uh, as uh, I started, kind of gave you a little int introduction of what uh, C++ is. Uh, we mentioned that object-oriented programming is essentially, uh, when you're doing object-oriented programming, what you're doing is essentially uh, um, packaging uh, the data and the behavior of the application into entities and make the entities simulate what you have the real entities in life about your application. So if I'm about to create an application that takes care of the student and a teacher, then I have to see what this thing is about. Is this about, is, it, is this from HR? And I'm looking at, at student as a person who's gonna work in the lab and a professor is supposed to teach or it's about uh, education and teaching so I want a student to uh, and check to see if the student has semesters and GPA and what courses the prof is teaching. So as you see, depending on what you deal in your application, the entities may have the same name, but uh, uh, the guts of them may be completely different uh, based on what you are doing in your applications. This is not in C++. This is normal in any language. In any language based on the criteria of the business logic, what business logic needs, but client needs, the actors of the application may behave differently based on the need of the application. Everybody's clear on that? Clear one, clear two, yes. <laughs> so one person is clear and no one else knows what I'm talking about. So, yeah, so, so we are clear about that. Now, this aspect of uh, language, is this aspect of programming, we call it, anybody knows what does it, when, when you t talk about a cert certain actor and that actor means differently based on the needs of your application, what is this? What do you have to apply to be able to implement this? UML diagram is to design object oriented, like flow charting for object orientation. Okay, that's the different thing. Have you ever, have you ever been in, a, in, in these museums when they have abstract art and they have a triangle with three dots on it and that's a, that's a beautiful lady. I'm like, what? Yeah, from the point, point of view of the artist, right? So you look at the thing and they say this is an abstract art. When you look at it, you have no idea what it is until they tell you what was the artist imagining, right? So the abstraction in art is the same thing in computer science. The action of choosing what your actors need to do and what not to do based on the need of, an app, of the application, we call it abstraction. And if you don't master that, 
you won't be able to program ever in your life. Because the details of everything in world is so much that you've got to get lost in it. You have to make sure to understand how to limit yourself, to finish quickly and do what is needed and nothing more. And practice that in your tests and exams, especially. So when I'm asking you to do this and this, don't write 200 different things and now you're out of time and you did only half of the stuff that I wanted and you added so many things that are all perfectly correct but has nothing to do with what I asked for. So remember that. This abstraction is really important. Okay? Now, um, when we are... Um, so um, what I'm... Uh, what I have essentially is this. I'm, I'm having this thing in front of me, and I'm taking a look at the, uh, maybe I should put it at the board over here. I don't know. But uh, I don't usually follow it exactly like this, like what it says over here. It kind of reminds me of what to talk about. So um, um, because of the fact that I mentioned, it just mentioned to you, there is something in C++ that you did not have in C because of the fact that the same actor can behave and mean differently from two different points a point of view, okay? So, for example, if I want to have a professor, again, from the HR point of view, what I need is the seniority to see how many years the professor was teaching, what is the level of education, so I know uh, how much I'm supposed to pay the person. Right? And if I want to write from the education part, I want to know what are the expertise of the prof and what subjects the professor can teach and what are the current subjects of the professor. So as you see, there are two different things. Now, you know what structures are. You're coming from C language, correct? What is a structure? It is a Couldn't be better than that. It is a, I've never said that, actually. It's a beautiful thing to say. It is a collection of different types of variable to represent a record about what we want to talk about, right? Now, if I want to, and by the way, if you are, again, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but um, we have the pass magic word over here. So if, did I say the pass thingy? Okay, so, so you know that you can say pass if you don't want to answer it. I'm just going to go to the person beside you. All right, so, so if I want to create, so let's actually write it. So, wait a minute, it's breathing, there you go, here we are. So I'm going to create a new item. Uh, our extensions are CPP for C++, okay? Our extensions are CPP for C++, and that's how we're going to uh, write our all code. We write uh, include, this is uh, universal for now. Uh, Back there, can you see the code, or it's too small for you? you want, if anybody wants, to, wants me to enlarge the code, the, 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 the font, let me know. Okay, we're good? All right. So you say include IO stream, and IO stream is uh, a library of all the things, all the input output stream things that we have. C++ calls all its input and output devices, streaming devices. So your stream series of characters on a, on a, on a screen, ha, you see stuff. You read stream of characters from the keyboard, and you read from the keyboard, right? So and that's that one. And immediately after this, we say, uh, actually, let's not say anything. I'm just going to say over here, int main, OK? I'm not going to do that. So now I want to print something out. We, have that, we had that example before. So I'm going to say from the namespace std, uh, bring the console output object, and uh, uh, in here, type namespaces. And write over here, std and l. So because I did not mention the s using namespace std, every single object that is on std, I have to say, this belongs to std, this belongs. So that, two columns that you see, we call that scope resolution. Scope resolution is kind of like apostrophe S in English when it comes to namespace, like Fardad's head. So that's standard, standard namespaces C out. Okay? It's something like that. All right? So back to that uh, teacher thingy that we talked about, or professor, teacher, whatever you call it. So if we are talking about a teacher, if I want to write a structure for a teacher, I'm going to write over here struct 
teacher, and I'm going to say the struct teacher of mine over here, it is from the HR point of view. So I want to know what is the number of years that, he, that the person is working and, mm, I don't know, double salary. Salary. And let's start the rules as we are going right now. Anything that belongs to a structure, you start it with an M underline. Okay? It does, you don't have to. But at any time in your life when you get hired in a company, they give you a booklet this thick and they say these are our coding regulation. And they follow certain types of regulations for name of variables, things that you are doing. Any variable that sits inside the structure, you start it with an M, not, M underline. Why? Because the sky is high at the moment. Later on, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Okay? I don't want to clutter your clutter the teaching by, but but just because I want to follow the rules right from the beginning, this is M underline years and M underline salary. So that's the thing. Now we are in the education department, and we want to actually see what uh, a teacher is. So I'm going to create over here a struct. And what do I call this? I, have, I don't want to call it another thing. It's not different. So I want to call it a teacher, right? I'm going to call it a teach. If I can type it, I'm going to call it a teacher, OK? And this teacher of mine with the same name as the other one, this one has, I don't know, uh, character. Uh, subjects and it's an array of let's say four subjects the person can teach and each one can have maximum of say 80 characters and that will be the name of the subjects that they're teaching and uh, this uh, teacher teaches uh, these semesters so semesters which semesters the teachers so let's say they can teach in three different semesters at the same time. And again, I'm going to follow the thing, and I'm going to put over here M underline. And in here, I'm going to put M underline again. So the problem with this is that if such a thing happens, if I need to have two teachers from two points of abstraction, if I compile it, you'll know that one definition, one declaration rule prevents us to compile this code because I have two structures with the same name. That's when namespaces come to the play, come to play. Why? Now I'm going to say, hey, all the people in the HR department create your code in a namespace called HR. I'm not using a namespace, I'm creating a namespace. And all coders for the education part of the college, create whatever you have in a namespace called edu. So now if, you, if I actually want to create a teacher, all I need to do is to say hr z teacher t, t1, and then I can say uh, edu's teacher, and that's t2. So T2 is a teacher for education purposes. T1 is a teacher for HR purposes. And one thing you notice over here, there is different with C language. What is that in my code? Huh? You don't need to say struct. In C++, any structure that you create automatically becomes a new type. So you don't need to say struct something again, struct some. When you create a structure, the teacher becomes an object, and it's done. Become, sorry, a type, a composite type that is made up of other things, but it's still a type. All right? So that's one of the most important things about C++'s types. Any structure that you create, and from now on, I'm going to refer to structures with the name class. So when I say class, I mean structure. So I created two classes over here, one teacher class that belongs to HR and another teacher class that belongs to EDU. I'm just familiarizing you with the lingo. OK? Are we good down to this point? Are we good one? Are we good two? Are we good? I'm not going to fall for that again. Yes.
Why we are doing that? OK, I'll tell you why. Because I'm sick and tired and keep typing STD over here. So I'm going to say, hey, compiler, in this code, I'm going to mostly use the STD namespace. Therefore, so uh, now you'll see what happens over here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually save this. So I put stages. So this becomes a namespace, oh, a dash namespace dot cpp. So when you are going back to the, to the uh, code on repository, a is the first one that I actually wrote. And then I'll close it, I open it, and I'll continue with the rest. So this is the continuation. So you can put the codes beside each other and see what improvements were made. So answering to your question, why do I put using? Because STD, this program that I'm writing, is, mostly go, or is, most, is going to mostly use the HR facilities and all the standard facilities. Therefore, in here, of course, all these things are going to be in a header file. You know that. It's not going to be in, a, in, in your program. All the class definitions and everything, as you have seen in uh, IPC 144, all these things stay in a header file. So you, can, so you can bring the definition to different files if you want to. We'll come to it soon. But in here, I'm going to say, for example, using namespace edu and use, did I say hr or edu? I said mostly I'm using HR or EDU. HR, so I'm going to say HR. <laughs> HR, and I'm going to say using namespace STD. Doing so, I do not, do not need to mention HR over here, and I do not need to mention STD over here or here. If I want to actually use the teacher of EDU, I can qualify it so we know this T2 of ours is education, educational teacher. And this one is just for HR. Are we good? Did I answer the question? All right. So in here, I'm going to save this one. Alt F8, save. And, and I have an answer in three seconds. Give me a second. So in here, I'm going to call it B dash using name space dot cpp so you'll see what happens yes yes we'll come to it soon those are called modules we're going to get to it soon yeah we'll, we're going to learn how to create modules no it's it's not going to confuse because when you have been actually it, it clears things up what do you call it? What are you gonna call a teacher? Educator? So which gonna say HR is gonna call the teacher's educator. Education is called, it's gonna call it teacher, and let's say, I don't know, library is gonna call it lip teacher. You don't want that. You want everything to be called the same. All you need to do if you want to see which teacher you are dealing with, you simply qualify the thing and you know you're dealing with a teacher that's doing education now, not getting paid. OK? Are we good? All right. All right. So these are namespaces. So that's a new concept. In, this is actually a new concept in C++. It was like either I didn't know it when I started C++ or it didn't have it. Long time ago in the galaxy far, far away, when I actually started C++, I never used namespaces. But at the time, either I didn't know what was it or it wasn't there. So. That's that. And namespaces can hold anything. You, any code that you put in a namespace belongs to that namespace. You, you declare a variable in there. That variable is, again, remember, there is one difference between a class. When I say class, what do I mean? Structure. So when I say a structure, so if you have two structures with the same name, if you have two structures with the same name, the two structures collide. You cannot have them. There's a conflict, OK? But when you have two namespaces with the same name, it's like two bubbles that join and make a bigger bubble. They do not have a conflict. So if I have another thing, HR namespace over here, namespace 
HR. And in here, I have a struct, say, employee that only has a double salary. It's not a perfect design, people. I'm just giving an example, okay? So if I have something like this, there is no error. The namespace HR has two classes in them. One is employee, the other one is teacher. Got it? Okay, so two namespaces with the same name, they just merge and make a bigger one. That's why we have a humongous namespace called STD and all the header files of C++, of C++ are implemented in it because they are all in namespace STD and you add them, they become bigger, bigger, bigger. All right? What do we write our code in in Seneca? Namespace SDDS. SDDS, our school name. So any code that you write in your files, they are all namespace SDDS. Not using, you're going to write namespace SDDS to create your name, to create your code within a namespace SDDS. But in mains, in testers, we use the namespace SDDS. So main modules use the namespace you create in other modules. Are we good? We'll come to you. These are the things that I just want you to know. And when the time comes and we get into it, it's going to get better and better as we deal with it. Yes, unless we tell you something else. Unless we tell you the namespace is something. So if we don't mention, it's SDDS. If we do mention, then it's not. If I tell you this thing is created in this namespace, you do it, okay? If we don't mention, it's, it's SDDS. Of course, uh, um, I don't think you, you do anything with that in workshop one. Workshop one is just a review of IPC 144, essentially, and doing some seam and see out, okay? So that's that one. So as you noticed, let me just, uh, so we, I'm going to say over here, C, I'm going to say namespaces. With, there you go. With uh, same, namespaces with same name merge. Okay? Remember that. All right, now let's go back to... Now, uh, two global objects we have, two global objects we have that use these two global, global objects. What, remember like we talked about wake up at night and you being scared because nobody, remember that? Okay, so everything that we have in C++, they can do things. They, every object that we have, now you can kind of get the message. Structures in C++, they don't only hold variables. You can actually put functions inside structures. We kind of get that. We're going to get to it soon about, and those things we call the methods. So again, potatoes, potatoes, just, uh, it's like Windows 11 and 10. When you look at it, it's the same thing, but they are, they are bringing the menu now in the middle, and they hide some of the items and show it on the back. So it's the same thing. They just, you know, it's the same thing over here. All right? So remember. Uh, now, um, uh, when we call it method, they are essentially functions, but these functions of members of classes, members of structures. Okay? Um, so all the objects that you see, uh, sorry, in these two objects, that these are two global objects. When we say global, it means these two objects are created in, in the IO stream module, okay? But they are global and accessible everywhere if you include the IO screen. So if you, I, did I say IO screen? Uh, I, I, o, I O stream, yeah. So if you include I O stream, these two global objects become available to you. And these two global objects are created uniquely because you cannot have two input consoles. That doesn't make sense. You don't have two screens. You have one screen then you, and, and you have one, one place to get stuff, so they are unique things. That's why uh, these two objects, one is called C out, 
for console output. The other one is C in for console input. For now, we learned that there are two operators that work with these two things. We have uh, insertion operator for C out, you insert on your screen, and we have extraction operator on C out where you extract characters from your keyboard. Okay, and they work exactly as I as I mentioned. So first of all, I'm gonna say over here using namespace std, using namespace std, and uh, uh, what I'm gonna do next over here would be uh, just try some things over here, and so you'll see what I mean. So, so if I say over, I can say over here, see out, hello. What is your name? Okay. And I'm going to do it like that so you can answer in front of it. Now I'm going to create over here uh, a C string. And again, I call it a C string. C++ has a string of its own that you're going to work with in OOP 345. In here, you may work a little bit with it. We'll try to simulate it and create it ourselves. But remember, when I say C, str C string, it means good old C string. What is a C string? Do you remember? Definition of a C string. When I say C string, what do you really mean? What do we mean? Group of characters that reside in a? <laughs> so reside in a character array which? What is so specific about the character array that we call it a string? Do you know? You want to pass? What is the difference between a character array and a C string? Null termination. A character is a character array. To call it a string, you have to put a stop sign at the end. With a character array, you don't know where the data ends. There's no backslash. It's, it's, it's zero. It ends with zero. No, zero, no, OK? Backslash zero essentially means a character whose ASCII code is zero. That means zero, right? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, uh, so that's a string. So we create a C string. So I'm going to create a C string over here, and I'm, call, call, I'm going to call that C string name. And I'm going to say that's 81 characters, OK? Like C language, it is not, it doesn't know what is the link of that name. So although C in is intelligent enough to understand what to get, so I'm going to say over here C in into name. So I'm going to say extract the name from console input and put it in name. Then in here I'm going to say C out. Hey. Name. How are you? Something like that. And then go to new line. So you see, it is very object oriented. I do not need to tell to CN this is a string. CN is intelligent enough to know if it is a string or not. OK? It knows by itself. OK? And not only that, I can do something like that. How old? Are you? OK? And again, I'm not going to go to new line because I'm asking a question. Now, in here, I can actually have integer age. And now I can do the exact same thing with C in over here saying C in age. And I'm going to say uh, C out um, hello. Welcome to Seneca Bar. <laughs> OK, so what is your name? That's that. How old are you, age? And I'm going to say over here, if age is greater than 19, that's 19, right? In Ontario, it's 19. OK, OK, in here, I'm going to say, see out, what would you like to drink? Drink, drink, OK and go to new line. I'm not going to continue this conversation. This is the end of the program. Other than that, I'm going to say get out of here. OK? See out. Uh, get out of here. OK? So something like that. 
All right? So now if I run the program, and how do we run the program step by step? Magic, what is it? Anybody knows? F10. F10 starts from the beginning, right? You can say where, so if you forget, go to debug, it tells you how to start. So F10, step over, F11, step into. What is step over? It means when you get to a line, execute everything. Step into, it means if it's a function, go into the function and now do it. So step over, step into, so that's how we do it. I'm gonna press F10, as my friend said over here, and three years later when it compiles, and runs, hopefully if I don't have an error. So now I'm gonna put this one and this diagnostic tools I'm gonna close. I don't want the call stack. Um, let me put this, I'm just organizing it so next time it doesn't and I'm gonna bring it down so you don't see it. Now I'm gonna stick this one over here and bring the, um, the code at left so we can see the execution at that and the other one is over here. So I'm gonna press F10 and as soon as I press F10, what do I have in name? Garbage. What do I have in age? Garbage, right? It's all garbage, there's nothing in there. So in here, F10, it's gonna execute that. Hello, welcome to Seneca, what is your name? I'm gonna say over here, Jack. Oh, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna say Jack over there, control Z, hopefully. Um, oh, I have to do C in name, so it printed. Now it's gonna say C in name, and now it's gonna wait for my name, and I'm gonna say Jack and hit enter, and as soon as we hit enter, we'll see that now name holds Jack. Are we okay with this? Okay, now, age it, now it's gonna say, now it's gonna say, hey Jack, how old are you? So we're gonna say, hey Jack, how old are you? I'm gonna say 23. Oh, again, I forgot to execute it. It has to execute the C in, <clears throat> that extracts another thing from keyboard, and I'm gonna say over here 23, hit enter, and now as you see over here we have 23 age, and if we look at this condition, we highlight the whole condition, we look at it, the condition is, the condition is true as you see that, right? So all these facilities of, C, of I, Visual Studio IDE, we should use. These type of debuggings help us to see how our program is running. So because it's true, the first part of the if statement is going to get executed, therefore we're going to get in there and I'm going to say, what would you like to drink? And the program ends, of course, and yada, yada, yada. Okay? Uh, any questions now to this point? Yes? What we'll, is Oh, we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Oh. Baby steps, my friend, baby steps. Okay. If I... If I want to teach you the whole thing right now, then I'll be out of business, right? I have to, <laughs> I have to keep making it longer and longer. But no, no, those, those, uh, okay. So answer to your question. Answer to your question. When you are writing a program that requires a user interface, approximately 20 to 30% of your effort goes to business logic. Around 70 to 80% of your effort goes to deal with the stupid user who's got to keep making mistakes. And usually that stupid user is us, ourselves, when we are doing the program, right? You, you just saw when I was doing it, I kept entering the, co the, the, the entry inside the text editor instead of, so it happens, right? So those type of things are the most difficult parts of the thing. There are, this C in that you see, it has so many different functions that can so, do so many different things that you'll see, and it's a, a beautiful thing to work with. And these two guys, see in and see out, they're very shy objects, which means if you do something wrong with them, they're not gonna talk to you anymore. So if you say, how old are you? Instead of 23, you write T-W-N-T-Y space, T-R, if you, T-H-R-E, if you actually write something that is not like that, first of all, it's not gonna receive it, Secondly, if you use C in again, it's not going to talk to you. So it completely becomes disabled. The same thing as C out. If C out cannot write, it fails. It won't write anything for you anymore. Okay? How? We'll find out later on. But these are, the, but you can always t ask them, are you okay? If it say no, you say, I apologize. Could you please start working here? Then it will. So this conversation that you're asking, are you okay? And it's going to say no, helps you to understand user entered something stupid. 
Now you can say, I apologize. Please clear the garbage. Let's do it again. That's where the loop comes. That's where all these things are going to come in. We're going to come talk about those things very soon. RBOK1, RBOK2. So, okay, next. And next, what are we talking about next? Let me, um, first, most important thing, magic. Ooh. Okay, so um, I just want to um, go over here with section A we are, right? Uh, where do I go, where do I go? Uh, Imagine for those people who are listening to this lecture, he says, what the heck is he talking about? Where do I go? Where do I go? Okay. <clears throat> oh, now we're going to talk about some good stuff. We're going to talk about classes and see what classes are, what are they good for, and uh, all these things that we said we are supposed to do, what they really are. Okay? So we said we pack data and behavior together, right? What did I call that? Remember that? Anybody remember what we call that thing? Encapsulation, right? So put the data and behavior together is encapsulation. We actually encapsulate things together. That's first step for programming when you're doing programming. And putting the data and behavior together is something like this. So when you're, uh, the examples that I'm going to write over here, uh, write over here for you is beyond the level at the moment but I'm giving you very small examples to see uh, uh, what we can do with all these things. It's very simple. You'll see exactly what it is and uh, uh, makes your life uh, a little easier later on. Um, so this one's going to be, uh, what did I talk about? A C in, uh, C out, dot CPP. So when we were talking about data and behavior, so for what we created over here, it would be nice if I create actually a class. Remember I said when I say struct is a class? And I'm going to call it a customer, right? Customer, right? And this customer of mine has character name that is 81, right? And it has uh, an integer h, right? Now, in here, I can actually have something like void get name. And this get name of mine will have exactly this, C in name. You see that? So I'll put it in here. And because name is in the same scope of this one, get name doesn't need to qualify it. It's like I know where my head is. He knows where his head is. She knows. She knows where head, head is, her head is. Everybody knows where their own head is, right? That's the same thing. Every customer knows where their name is. So it's not going to get confused with the name that is written in here, right? And also, I can have something else over here, right? Something like void get age. And I can even make these things. So I'm going to have over here C in age, OK? And in here, I can have something like void introduce, introduce yourself, <laughs> OK? And in here, I'm going to say see out hello, hello, my name is, I don't need to mention, when I say name, it knows my name. I'm in there. And in here, and I'm going to say over here, and I am age years old. OK? So, and then goes to new line. So in here, 
So in here, I'm going to say, what is your name? And in here, instead of having character name and age, I'm going to create a customer. C. And in here, I'm going to say C dot get name. As you see, as soon as I put dot, it shows all the things that the customer has, right? You see that? Age. So now I have to follow the rules. Now we know why we are writing M over there. So now in here, I'm going to write M name and M age. Why do I do that? So anytime I just type over there M, automatic, automatically it's going to list all the member variables of this class. So M name and M age. In here is going to be M name and M age. OK? And that is the extent of the things that I'm going to go. So in here, I'm going to say C in get name. And as you see, get name is going to come up. And in here, I'm going to say In here, I'm going to say, how old are you? That's interesting. 2022 has changed. Because usually when you highlight and you do something, it wipes everything up. Apparently, it doesn't in here. It actually adds it at the beginning. So, oh, Intelli thingy. OK, so how old are you? And in here, I'm going to say C in, uh, I'm going to say C dot get age. And then C dot introduce yourself. And it's going to see, it's going to explain who it is and so on and so forth. OK? So, so now if I run the program, um, again, step by step, I'm going to go through it. It comes in here, runs the program. And let's, let's put it at right and put this one at left. So it runs the program. First, it creates a customer. And if you look at the customer, you'll see customer has two members, age and name. They are both garbage. Then it's going to uh, print, hello, welcome to Seneca Bar, what is your name? Now if I press F11, it's going to walk into. So it goes into the function and says, see in name. So it receives the name. In here, I'm going to say Jane. And I hit Enter. And I get out. And now if you look at the customer, you will see that the name is Jane. But, la but the age is garbage. So we come over here. Uh, how old are you? And then we get the age. The exact same thing happens. So I'm pressing F10 to just go through it. In here, I'm going to say 21. Hit Enter. And it's going to introduce itself saying, hello, my name is Jane, and I'm 21 years old. Got it? That's encapsulation. I'm not going to go, the rest of the stuff, I'm not going to put code for it because that's till the end of the semester. So, so it's just to show you how easy it is. Uh, there is no uh, extraordinary thing happens when I say we do encapsulation. All you need to do, the good thing is that now I can create an array of customers, 10 customers. Each one of them will have their own name, their own age, and each one of them can set their own name and their own age and introduce themselves. So you don't have to pass anything anywhere. In C++, in C language, if you wanted to set the name of a cu customer, you had to create a function. And in that function, you had to actually mention, pass this structure to it so I can set it. That's not the case in C++. In C++, Every single object know how to deal with its own stuff. Are we good? This, ladies and gentlemen, is called encapsulation, putting the
the data and behavior together. RBOK1, RBOK2. All right. The, the other two things that I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to tell you what they are, I'm not going to give you a sample code. I'm going to give you an example from real life. We've talked about it, I think, before. You know what they are, but I cannot code it because it's much more complicated than that, okay? Uh, uh, but uh, you will see, okay? Mm, let me think. What's the time? 4.13. I think we can get, get, get a break, right? Like five, five, ten, five, five minutes break, and then we're going to continue. Please remind me to resume recording, okay, when I come back. All right, I thank you very much for reminding me to resume recording. If I forget, remember, there is another section. Although there is no guarantee that all sections have exactly the same lectures, because depending on what questions comes up, different things are going to get covered. But yeah, so uh, 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 the question was asked, like, uh, like if I wanted to check to see if it's le that the person is legal, uh, legal age to get uh, uh, booze in a bar, what are we going to do? So if that's the case, it brings us to uh, uh, a new type of variable that we have in, in C++. In C language, everybody complained that all these true false things are very confusing. Because uh, you say, uh, what is, what is uh, true in C language? What, one? So 25 is not true? Anything except zero. Thank you. Yeah. So what is false in C language? Zero. zero. Thank you. So in C language, zero is false. Anything but zero is true. Are we all good with this? OK, in C++, they did something as it, they said, okay, the heck with it, because it seems to be very confusing for people who don't know how to write C. I don't see why, but they said we are going to add a type. This type is called a Boolean, B-O-O-L, Boolean. It essentially occupies normally one byte, and if you put any value other than zero in it, it will be one. And zero is zero. We don't need to. So, so, so it, when you print a Boolean value, it's going to print one. If it's true, it's going to print zero if it's false. So it's essentially an integer value that is forced to be one if anything other than zero goes into it. That's all. No difference. Okay? So it's literally an integer, but with that things. Okay? Now, having said that, I can actually now, because it's uh, the, the, uh, customer of mine is now a, a class, what I can do over here is to create a function called boolean, and I'm going to call it over here legal. How do you write legal? Legal. How do you write legal? Spelling legal. Legal, legal age. Okay. And in here, I'm going to say return m age greater than or equal to 19. I'm not going to even write an if statement. So what happens if somebody calls this function, it's going to get the value of h, check it to see if it's greater than or equal 19. If this condition is true, what is the value? 1. 1 is return. If the condition is false, what is the value? 0 is re return. So now in here, I'm going to say, uh, uh, so how old are you? Something like this. It's going to introduce himself. Now in here, I'm going to say, if c dot legal age. Now I'm going to say the good thing is that I can take this program to Quebec, change the 19 to 18, and it still works, right? <laughs> okay. So I don't. So that's what it's going to. So now in here I'm going to say uh, the same thing. See out. Uh, um, what would you like to drink? <laughs> Seriously, would you? Okay. And and the same old thing that in here I'm gonna say else, see out, get out of here. Okay. So these are the and what I wrote over here is not a C plus plus thing, people. What I wrote over here is not a C++ thing. In C, you could do the same thing. 
just that bool is an integer. That's the difference. That's the only thing. Still, the condition is a condition. And it's something that you need to realize that I don't know if they told you in C or not, all operators in C return value. All operators. It doesn't matter what. Logical operators? Let me see what it is. Where? No, there's, we have an active shooter, but where? Peel regional. Oh, we are not in. Okay. All right. Uh, we, is it is this peel? Should be a friend. <laughs> Anyways, all right. We just wanted to see if there's a word Seneca in there so we can run. <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah. So um, that's all. It doesn't make any difference. So if it's true, it's going to return one. If it's false, it's going to return. So all the things uh, you'll see when we are when I'm going to write code, I'm going to try to write the code more professionally. Like people would actually write an if statement over here and return stuff, which is very wrong, because your program is actually has one extra step. If you write an if statement, the compiler has to do a condition, then do a conditional jump to see what it wants to return very ugly thing. In here, it just returns what it's decided. You don't need to. So you have to always think that way. And another thing that I have to mention, each function, each method you are writing has one point of entry and one point of exit. You have two returns in a function, your code is rejected. Remember that. You are not allowed to have more than one return statement in, in, a, in a function. Many profs like to do that. I don't. We are beyond the age of spaghetti code. Having two return statements is essentially means you are doing a go-to to the end of the state, uh, function, which is a very bad thing. If you want to return two different var values, create a variable, set it to two different things, and at the end, return that one. Don't have two return statements in a function. Remember that. I do not like that. All right? So that's that. So now we know the next thing, actually, we need to talk about what we said we need to have another thing that we... Uh, we need to be able to actually to do is what we call polymorphism. Polymorphism is essentially what, uh, um, can I change those get names? I want to change those get names to set name. Get, when you are telling, when you are saying C get name, it means you are getting the name of C. When you are saying C set name, you are setting the name of C. So the name is bad over there, I'm going to fix that. How do I uh, uh, change it? It's control H, okay? Get name, I'm gonna change it to set name. And I'm gonna say current document, change everything, boom, done, okay? And then now in here, I'm gonna do a set, uh, a get age. I'm gonna go control H again. And in here, I'm gonna say set age, okay? That's dangerous, because you may have 50 other different gets that you don't want to change. <laughs> okay. What's going on here? Oh, oh there's bugs in 22. Anyways, so uh, let me just compile and see if it's okay. Rebuild. It's good. Okay, so next thing we said, an object-oriented program uh, requires to have to become object oriented is when objects do the same thing in different ways. Remember that? We said airplane flies, fly flies, and things like that. Okay? Sometimes when you are setting a name, you don't want to get it. You know what the name is, you just want to set it. You don't want to ask the person. You know the person is here, his name is John. You want to set it. So if you want to set the name, you don't want to get it from anywhere. You want to actually set it. If that's the ca they, case, we could have another function over here called set name, and then have over here a constant character pointer name, and simply bring C string in. Remember, it's not string header file anymore, it's called C string. Anything that comes from C.h, anything that you had, 
Like if for some reason you want to use STDIO, it's not STDIO.h in C++ anymore. It's called CSTDIO. So this C string is essentially string.h from C. Okay, so I'll bring this one, and in here I can actually say str copy into m name, and I'm going to pass the name. So as you see, the names are func of functions are identical. It's doing the same thing in a different way. How can it be possible? In C, if you did that, you get an error, right? In C++, it knows it by itself. Now in here, I can have another customer. Uh, let's call it D. <laughs> okay. Now in here, I can actually say D.setName. And in here, I'm going to call it Fred. And because C++ looks at the argument and sees the argument is a constant character string, it knows which one to pick up automatically. Therefore, doing the same thing in a different way, polymorphism, okay? Polymorphism has so many different faces in C++. This is the basic one. So, and it's not only for member functions. You can do it for any function. You can have five different functions with the same name as long as the arguments are different. Automatically, it picks up the one whose arguments match the one that you are calling. So in here, instead of set set age getting it from the uh, console, I can have another set age that receives an integer age over here, and simply say says over here m age is age. So now that d guy who's Fred can be d dot uh, uh, set age. And in here, I'm going to put 18. And if I come to the end of this program, actually, you know what? I should have saved it with a new name. Copy. Just a second. Don't save. Alt F A. So this is encapsulation. Encapsulation.cpp. OK. And let's bring this one up. And now in here, I'm going to remove th those things. Uh, that hello, shmello thing. Yeah, we saw it in the other one, and we're just going to test that. Now I'm going to say, um, actually, let me reuse some of the code so I don't have to type it again. In here, I'm going to say d.legalH. I'm going to say get out of here. And now I can actually have a function called constant character pointer get name to actually get a name and return m name. So I can actually ask the name of the object from the object too. So now in here I can say d.getName, get out of here. Of course, it's a function call. And it's going to return. So as you see, I have a customer. I'm setting the name, setting the age. If it's an illegal age, I'm going to say, what would you like to read? If it's not, I'm going to call its name and say, get out. Right? Easy breezy. So you see that like object orientation is not something complicated. It's exactly like C, build errors. OK, let's see what's the error. So what does it say? SDR copy, unsafe. Oh, yeah, good. So now that we know. Because these things uh, deal with pointers, unprotected pointers, pointers that you can actually, like SDR copy, it's 80 characters. I can copy 100 and the compiler won't know, right? These are considered unsafe. Because they are unsafe, at the top, we have to mention something. You did that in IPC 1.4, right? Fine. Yeah. So. Okay, so let's get that thing out of the way. Now, if I run the program, it works the same way, but it's just going to say, Fred, get out of here. It's not going to ask for any name. It set it up. It's not legal. It's going to set it out of here, okay? 
Yeah, so yeah, if you want, you can create a get h to and say you're 18 and you do it at home, change it, do whatever you want to do, okay? So this one, I'm gonna call it polymorphism. Okay, so that's polymorphism for you. All right, the next one, I cannot give you an example. That's too rich for our blood. Inheritance, okay? Inheritance is when I create an employee that has a salary, okay? And everything that an employee has. Then in HR, I create a teacher out of employee, and I only mention uh, what is the amount of years that it's working. And because an employee already has a salary, the teacher will inherit all the actions and properties of an employee. And so I don't, so I, I, I don't, I reuse my code. I reuse my design. Too rich for our blood, second half of the semester. Okay? No, no. But that's what we're going to do. So what are the three pillars of object orientation? Inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation. Right? And what are the two things? Did I talk about two things after that? They said there are actually five. Okay, that was, sorry, three, four, five I was teaching, but I'm going to tell you, these three, two things you have to add. One, proper abstraction. Okay, so these are, when I say five, it, two comes for, from any language. Actually, no, one comes from any language, and the other one, we call it synergy. What is synergy? Is that just having a, fun, having a function with the same, two functions with the same name doesn't mean that your, your application is polymorphic. Just because you used inher inheritance in one class, it means it's polymorphic. You, your design, these three things should work together in synergy. Have a good design that you'll find out later on how it is to actually be an object-oriented language. Just using them doesn't mean that you have an object-oriented program. You have an object-oriented capable compiler, but to write an object-oriented program, you need to make these things work hand-to-hand. -hand enforce things that they are supposed to do, and that becomes an object-oriented language. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Sold. All right. Next, I'm going to finish the whole semester today. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> modules. When we say module, what do we mean? Let me just see if I can actually bring you a good example from somewhere. When we talk about modules, essentially we mean that anything that is related with respect to goal and task, and they are all related somehow, all the code that are related somehow, you put it in a separate file and you get all the functionalities of that thing that is necessary outside, you put it in a header file. Therefore, when you include that header file in some other files, everything becomes accessible and uh, your programs become modular. Um, so for that, let me do this. want to kind of cheat. I'll tell you what, what do I mean by cheating. I'm just going to do this. Copy. Go back. And come to this semester. All right. So, paste. So let me add another project to the solution existing project and I'm gonna go to 244 200 go here and a 
ماجگاه سپتمبر 12-ماجگاه So we know it's the same thing. And VCX project, I'm going to open it. It's going to say it's an old one. You want me to convert it? It didn't convert? Oh, I thought it's going to convert it. <coughs> All right. So take a look at this. If I look at this, uh, oh, there you go. Let's look at this code. Okay? Look at the code over here. It's a code <coughs> that is working for a, uh, working as a, a shopping list type of a thing, let's call it, right? And it, has, it does so many different things. If you take a look at the main menu of this thing, it loads the item from the file. Uh, then uh, when it lo loads the item after that's going to close the file, shows a menu, prints the items, search the items, sort the items, uh, and it does many different things when the application is going to work. And if you look at it, it has so many functions in here. Each function over here is doing something. This is the sort items, which receives a structure of items, and it does a bubble sort on it. This one is ser searching the items, gets all the information about uh, the, the items in the, in the array, goes through them one by one, checks to see if the name is the same, and prints something out. It has a menu that it displays. It has a, uh, a function that receives a string from entry uh, with spaces. It has uh, uh, something, because he wanted the space, right? <laughs> so it flushes the keyboard. It gets an integer in a foolproof way. And these are all C language. You've already done it in C, OK? It gets a double in a foolproof way. It gets a double with a limit, lower and upper. So make sure it guarantees that you cannot enter a value between two things. Gets an integer for that thing. Asks if something yes or no. So it has so many different things in it in one file. And when you run it, it runs everything for you. OK? But that's not the right thing to do. The correct way of doing it is to break these uh, functions into separate files. All the stuff that is dealing with user interface, I'm going to put it in I.O. tools. So my I.O. tools have nothing to do with the application. It's functions that help me read and write. I have a get string function, flushing the keyboard, get integer, get double, get limited integer, say yes or no, and so on and so forth. And to expose all these things, as you see, they are in namespace SDDS, because that's what we need to do, right? So what happened over here uh, <clears throat> is that all these functions, prototypes, are now residing in a header file called uh, iotools.h. And I put all the prototypes of the functions over there. So any program of mine, including iotools.h, can do stuff like this. It's not specifically to my listing application that I have. Then I get all the other functions that are related to item, like load item, print title, print item row, read item, sort items, things that deal with item. I put it in a separate file, call it item.cpp and put all the functions and things that it has, all the prototypes, and the structure that it needs, and the definitions that it has, all these things, forget about this, I'll explain later, all these things I'm going to put it inside the header file. So any program who wants to deal with an item can use that module. Now my main application is an application that includes the I.O. tools and item.h to do something. And all it does is the main application, which is showing a menu and using all the parts of the engine that we have to do something. What I want you to do, to go home and actually walk through this, see how it works. It reads a file, reads from the file. It's a fully written application that I have written sometime, I don't know when, OK? But <clears throat> as you see, it's modularized now. Remember. <clears throat> 
every single function that you have related to input and output entry are packaged in a CPP and a header file, set aside. All the things that are related to item are put in an item.cpp and item.h set aside. Now that I have all the tools I need, I simply write a main to decide what to do based on a menu system and call the functions when I need to. It becomes a well-designed application and is modularized. So as you see, all header files are in namespace stds. As you see, all header files are in namespace stds. Did you do this in uh, IPC 144, these two lines at the top? No? OK. Uh, pardon me? Last milestone. <clears throat> OK, so what are those things? Those things need me to search and bring up an image I have created a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. All right, so let me see where I put it. I thought it's here. It's not. Let me do a quick search. I have it somewhere buried. I'll bring it up in a second. How compiler works. Searching. There you go. Okay. So, how does the compiler work in a modular application? Okay. Uh, anybody over here having problems seeing colors? Yeah. No? Oh, okay. So, so I just, because, uh, and believe it or not, like, this is the lowest, like, because um, usually five people say, I can't, see, it's, it's a uh, high, so, because th I did that when I didn't know about accessibility, I put it, I say, blue, red, and then I see some people are going like, what the heck are you talking about? Now I know. Okay. So, we have module one. We have module two, we have module three, and we have our main module. Module one does certain thing and it has its own header file. Module two does certain thing and it has its own header file. Module three does certain thing, it has its own header file, also uses module two. So module three includes the header file of module two. Main includes the header file of module one, the header file of module 2, not knowing that module 3 is actually using the header file of module 2, it includes that one too. What happens? I'm going to have two inclusions of header file of module 2, correct? That's error. So what do I do? I'm going to tell, I'm going to play a trick. So you know what define statement is. Define is essentially a search and replace. When you define something, you're asking the compiler before you do compilation, search through my code, find this thing, replace it with something else, right? Here, I'm playing a trick. I'm going to write a define statement, and I put a rule. Remember that book that I said, Coding Rules of Seneca College? That's what it is. These are called compilation safeguards. You, whenever you are writing a header file, you're obligated to write those two lines over there. And what you write over here as defined statement will be the name of the header file in capital, underline H, starting with STDS underline and ending with a single underline. You create that with your eyes closed. So obviously, if I look at item.h, it's going to be STDS item H. You see that? <clears throat> so anything that starts with a hashtag is not C language. It's a C compiler language. You're actually talking to compiler, asking compiler to do something before compilation. So you are telling to compiler, if stdsiotools.h is not defined, keep compiling. If this is the first time this, comp this header file is being compiled, obviously that is not defined, right? Because it's hitting it the first time. But the next the statement, what does it do? Defines it. So the first time it compiles, it gets compiled without you knowing, and it's going to happen. 
There is no question about it. The second time compiler hits it and wants to compile it, it says, if SDDI to IO tools underline edge is not defined. Oh, it is defined. So I'm going to ignore everything right to the end of its statement. Therefore, nothing over here will be repeated. Guarantees that each header file gets compiled only once in a module. Obviously, in separate modules, it's going to get compiled, but it's not going to get repeated. So <clears throat> an empty header file for you. So if I want to write a header file, say I want to, I'm going to say, write an header file for an employee. You right click, you say add, new item. It's going to be a header file. You put over here header, where is header file? And in here, I'm going to call it an employee, right? Emplo employee dot h, correct? You will see that it says pragma once. You see that? Pragma once is like you are going to McDonald's and say, I want combo number two. It says it comes like a, I don't know, Big Mac with fries and a drink, right? That's combo number two. It means write those statements for me. Compilation, it means, hey, compiler, compile this file only once. We don't like it. We want you to actually manually do it so you learn. So <clears throat> if you are creating an, an employee.h, this is what you do. You say, if not defined, if ndf, as you see, it adds a one over there. In here, you say sdds underline employee underline h underline. OK? You hit Enter. <clears throat> then you copy that. Don't retype it. Because you retype it, you do a spelling mistake, everything's going to get ruined. You have to make sure it's the same. You copy it. Then in here, you write define, and you paste it. And now you have an empty header file to work in. So when you write a header file without question, first you write this code. And obviously, because you are at Seneca College, another thing you're going to add. What is that? Namespace, SDDS, and you do that. OK? Now that's an empty header file. OK? And now you think what you want to do with, a, with an employee. So you should do this with your eyes closed. All right? It's a standard empty header file that you're writing. Are we good? All right. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, so that's what we have. And uh, now the program gets compiled, and everything's got to work perfectly. There is one thing you need to uh, uh, it, there is no need over here for it, but remember, if in any case, I'm so sorry, I thought I put it on, I um, put it on do not disturb, but apparently do not disturb doesn't mean hee-haw when somebody calls from WhatsApp. So I'm going <laughs> to close that. I set it up automatically to, this, to do not disturb to the time of lecture. And it just, <laughs> anyway, my apologies. I thought it works, so now I know it doesn't. I'm not going to bother anymore. Just muted myself. Anyway, so what I was saying is that if for any case you are using something over here from another namespace, you are never allowed to write using namespace in a header file. Absolutely not allowed. Using namespace can only be in a CPP file. Never in a header file. You don't get an error if you do it, but you will cause a very bad side effect, which means anybody including your header file without knowing is going to use a namespace. Suddenly gets exposed to, to hundreds of different names that they don't expect for them to be. So remember, using namespace never goes in a header file, ever. OK? In a header file, if you are using an object and a namespace is needed, qualify it. STD, scope resolution, whatever. Never, ever write using namespace whatever in a header file. <clears throat> so, and how really compiler works is like this. When you compile a project with several modules, which is essentially every single time, there is no way that you write anything out of kindergarten, and it's not filled with modules, OK? Nobody writes the whole thing in one file. It never happens, ever, OK? So whenever you are compiling a module, 
your compiler runs to the number of transa trans translation code uh, that you have, translation units that you have, which essentially means each module. So I have three, four modules in here. Compiler runs for four times. The C++ compiler separately will call, get called once for this, creates an object file. Once for the number two, creates an object file. One for number three, creates an, an object file. For four, creates an object, object file. Therefore, four object files are going to exist over here. Now, at this point, compiler only checks to see if your syntax is correct and things are done properly. So when you in file C are including a header file of file two, and in that one it says there is a function called foo over there, compiler doesn't care if the foo exists or not. It accepts your promise that you said there is a function called foo. Just implement the call. It's going to be there. Don't worry. It's as you tell me, far that I need help. I'm going to say, down in Learning Center, there is a tutor for C++ that's going to help you. You're happy. I'm happy. We are gone, right? You go downstairs to Learning Center, there is no tutor being found. That's linker error, not the compiler. Compiler wants help in C++, and I'm going to say there's a tutor. So you know there is a function down there in Learning Center to help you. But when you go down there actually to check promise uh, made is promise kept, then it gives you an error. So after the compiler is called four times, another program called linker for C++ will call and puts all these objects together and checks to see if all the promises are made, all the prototypes that Apple set, all the global variables that you promised that they will be there, they are there. If they are there, it creates an executable. You run it, and you see it doesn't work because there's logical error. So you go back, and you do it again. And that's an endless loop. It keeps going and going in years and years of uh, like how many updates you're getting on your phone. It's the same thing. <laughs> All the programs are like, no program is without a bug. You write a program, there is a bug somewhere that has to get fixed. You know, you call Rogers, they unplug it, plug it back in. That's because the program got screwed up hang somewhere and it doesn't work anymore. You have to reset it so everything starts from scratch. So it works for another two months. And then you do it again, OK? We'll come to that. That's called dynamic memory allocation. You'll see why that's going to happen, <clears throat> OK? Uh, what else? OK, so that's how compiler works. And let me actually save this. How can I? Let me just copy. Copy this. And I'm going to just drop this in right in here. So I'm going to go open. Uh, in file folder, and I'm going to just paste it in here. So that's uh, how compiler works. PNG is the picture that I'll just show you. It is in the source of what we have done today, OK? Uh, and the module thing is over there, too. Go over there, play with it, run it, see how it works, come with questions. Uh, <clears throat> OK? Um, uh, let me see what else do we have over here. Workshop one, work on it. If you have any problem, come to me. OK? <laughs> I told you, I'm not going to do workshop one, tell you what workshop one is. We wrote an inscription, read it. If you don't understand it, come to me with questions. And I told you that most of our labs is going to be lecture. And because we just started the thing and we are one week behind, I had to do lecture today. So <clears throat> any problems? I'm on Microsoft Teams, and I am very present. Uh, any question that you have, remember, two rules. Respect the dot, remember that? Which means take a look at the thing up there. If it's either yellow or green, just call me, OK? If you want to send me a message, fine. I'm not kidding, don't, don't. So you can send me a message at any time. But if you need to talk to me and you want to try to see if you can get me, don't please never ask me, can I call you? I hate to go. Yes, you can. Yes, just call me, OK? And if I see you are calling, so I'm busy, I'm going to tell you I'm going to call you back or I'll get you later. But <clears throat> work on it and come to me. We're going to uh, work on the workshop together. Hopefully, if we have more time, I'm going to actually talk about the workshop. But this is IPC 144. It's just a review, just a kind of a wake-up call for you from IPC 144. The next workshops are the ones that we are going to actually, I'm going to tell you what it is and give you some explanation about it. OK, so. <clears throat> Let 
Why everybody's packing? We have five more minutes left, right? And I have a class that's 510 and I'm here. So as a matter of fact, because that one is online, I have to actually start a session over here, then run <laughs> to see. I, I've never been in that room. Again. I've never actually taught online from college before. So we'll see how it's going to go. <clears throat> OK, so yeah, so actually, I think we are done uh, for the week. Good. So the next time you're going to come over here, we're going to talk about, so you have, your obligation right now is to go read all the things that we have for this semester, see what I missed. And you come with questions the next time. We answer those questions first. That's the, so this, the, the class starts like this. I come in, I say any question, anything about last lecture. You talk about it. If there is any vague parts about anything, I'm not going to continue. I don't care if I'm <clears throat> two weeks behind. I want I want the limited amount that you're learning, you actually learn. So if we fall behind, I rather fall behind and cover things properly than rush through to tell you I covered everything. That doesn't mean anything, okay? So you come with questions, any problem, and believe me, if you have problem, trust me, other 10 other people do too, and they're not just saying it, okay? So you're the hero. Come over here, tell me what the problem is. We'll go through those problems, and then we start the next lecture. And the story continues. All right? Any question one? <clears throat> Any question two? Yes? Quiz is always lab when you have a computer. Okay? Always lab. Next week, you're going to have quiz on what we talked about today, well, what we talk about today and next day, and a little bit from future. Yes? I don't know. Dash do is your friend. Right? Submit, yada, yada, yada. Dash do, hit enter. It is, it's not do tomorrow. It's impossible. Yeah. But anyways, just dash do. Okay? <clears throat> All right. Anything else? The reason is that, I, I, and I'm going to reset it. I have to, I, it's possible that I have to have different due dates for different sections. So. GitHub, the OP24 AP, uh, AMD notes. So I'm going to push it right now and show it to you. So I'm going to save, save everything over here. Everything's saved. Now take a look and see what happens. <clears throat> take a look and see what's going to happen and what we're going to have. So this is the notes that we had for today. These are the notes that we had for today. I'm going to go in here, right click on NAA and say, Tortoise Git add. It's going to add all the material that I had for today. I'm going to say commit. And in here, I'm going to say 0 to September 12th, right? Material. Commit and push. And I have to pull. I, I changed something over there. So if you see that happens, first pull. And then push again. Now I'm going to say pull. Push. So if the first time you do it, it doesn't work, it means there are some changes that you have to pull first. Now everything is on, on GitHub. All right? And the recording is going to be up when I go home and I upload it and yada, yada, yada. Okay. Anything else? Okay, now I have to start the session for the other.